Do you know some people get to heaven empty-handed? And this is where we left off yesterday. Remember my little picture of Samson? And I talked about the fact that, that you know, he was killed uh, destroying the temple of Dagon, uh, the, the Philistines' gods, and in the process became a hero of the faith but he is an example we're going to see of 1 Corinthians 3. So if you have your Bible, look at 1 Corinthians 3. And if you're a Bible underliner, this is an important passage to, to put an asterisk by or highlight, whatever you do. Um, but 1 Corinthians 3, I'm going to start actually in verse 10. It says, According to the grace of God who has given me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another has built on it. Now here comes the attention to us but let each one take heed how he builds. So what the Lord is saying is, our life is like, one of your names went by. I saw, uh, was it Lego Builder or something? Is somebody called something like that? I saw a name. Uh, I think it was Legos, I don't know. I thought Legos were a long time ago. But, But building things is a metaphor in the Bible for our lives. And it's like we get all these materials, we get all these tools, And then the Lord, at the end of our life, is going to assess what we did with our building materials and with our tools. So Paul says, take heed how you build, for no other foundation can anyone lay, verse 11, than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now that's where the famous saying of C.T. Studd, only what's done for Christ will last. Remember that? You've all probably heard that. It's on cards and people put it on their walls. Then, look at verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. What's fascinating is two groups. Gold, silver, precious stones are very hard to find. They're usually buried somewhere. Uh, you have to mine them out and go deep underground, and it's very hard. Wood? I mean, just between here and our cabin, I saw you know, all the branches falling down. There's wood all the, over the place. Hay and stubble? You know, hay is dried, dead stuff, and stubble is broken up, dried, and dead stuff. So it's everywhere. So the, the one group is everywhere, wood, hay, and stubble. The other group, gold, silver, and precious stones, are very hard to find. So he says, hey, you have a choice. You can go through life doing the hard thing or the easy thing. You can go through life just the simplest, you know, just gathering up the, the junk that's just thrown on the ground and strewn and easy to find and spend your time doing that, or you can labor uh, for me. So keep going. It's see whether it matters. Verse 13. Each one's work, each one of us, will become clear for the day, the day. Anytime you see that, it's talking about Christ's return, the day. Paul's always talking about the day. Uh, Martin Luther said, I live every day of my life with two dates, today and the day that Christ comes. He says, I, I know that moment is getting closer and I'm living every day for the day. So that's what the day is. It's the day of Christ, and the day will declare it. And now the next part I'm going to read in verse 13 is what most Christians don't think about. I can tell by the way they operate that they really don't think about this. Because we like to travel in crowds, and if you don't like your picture taking, you kind of get behind all the other people and, and if you don't want to do this, you just kind of move and let everybody else get in front. And we're so used to operating of just kind of maneuvering out of sight, except for those few people that like to be seen. But the rest of normal people aren't really wanting to be the center of attention. There are the clowns and there are the, you know, whatever, the people that always do that. But most people back away from being seen. But look at this moment. Everyone's work will become clear, verse 13, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one, each person, each individual's work, what sort it was. This is called the bima seat, this is called the judgment seat of Christ, this is called the day of reckoning, and look what it says. Verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, Now this is really the part most people never even ponder what this means. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he will be saved, yet so as through fire. Uh, Bonnie and I, when we started out ministering in New England, I pastored in Rhode Island, and and Bonnie was the most wonderful pastor's wife and women's ministry and everything. We lived in the church parsonage, and so we had come from California with MacArthur, and so we had to sell our house in California, and we had to buy 
a house here, but we lived in the parsonage, so we didn't know what to do. So the elders of the church says, why don't you just buy a house close by in Cape Cod, then you'll escape the tax loss of not rolling over your your equity, and so, you know, all those details. So we bought a house on Cape Cod, and it was nothing. It was a, a shack, actually. It was built on stones. It didn't even have cement foundations. It was a beach shack that was a hundred and some years old, uh, and, and snakes would crawl in. We would find snakes. In fact, your president, uh, Don Locke, uh, found a snake underneath our sink and when he was visiting our house. So, I mean, it's terrible, uh, this house. And the wind would blow through it, and every time it rained, all the dirt would come into the basement because it was stacked rocks. You know what I mean. It was, it was a shack. Well, we rented it out because we moved on to pasture in other places, and one of our renters was smoking in bed. And I don't know if they missed the ashtray, but somehow they started their bed on fire, and so much petroleum was used back then, which was 20 years ago, in all the bedding that it just burst into flame, and the whole house burned. It was horrible. I mean, it even injured them. They had to go to the hospital. Um, They escaped only with what they could grab. And they couldn't grab much because it started so fast. Now look back at verse 15. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss, but he'll be saved, yet so as through the fire. Empty-handed. Saved, that means go to heaven. So as through fire means you ran out as quick as you could and you didn't have anything that lasted, nothing that remained. You go to heaven empty-handed. Wow. Don't get to heaven empty-handed. And this whole lesson is going to be about Jesus telling these churches, they're going to end up like Samson. Yeah, you're going to be in heaven so as by fire. In fact, Job put it this way. There are a lot of English expressions that are in the book of Job. One of them is, by the skin of your teeth. What is teeth? Don't have skin. Well, if you have, you know, healthy gums, your gums come down a little bit between your teeth at the top. So it means a very little sliver. That's what by the skin of your teeth means. It means just barely. Some people, God says, Paul records in 1 Corinthians 3, are going to get to heaven by the skin of their teeth. They're going to get to heaven yet so as by fire. I mean, they're going to be running out and not have anything with them. Why? Because they spent their whole life collecting wood, hay, and stubble. I I describe the Christian life as being like going to Walmart. You push a cart through life, and you can throw anything you want into your cart. And you get to the end, and you pull up to the checkout. I don't mean the self-checkout. I, I like the ones where the little belt goes, and I can just stack it on there. And that's what our life is going to be like. And we're going to push our cart, how we live life, up to the, the um, checkout. We're going to put everything in our cart on there. And instead of going peep, 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 the cashier, who is Jesus Christ, is going to take our basket and run it through a fire. And anything that doesn't burn up in our basket is gold and silver and precious stones. And everything that does burn up is wood, hay, and stubble. Now you say, wait a minute. I thought all of our sins are gone. They are. Uh, no, no record of sin. This has nothing to do with sin. Wood, hay, and stubble is, is living for easy things that fill our time like, well, I mean, I could talk about a lot of things. Older people, you know what they do? They sit and watch the Home Shopping Network and they're ordering all these crazy things they don't need. Or they're watching all these rich and famous shows and, and being horribly disappointed they can't live in a house like that or go to a place like that. Or they're watching, you know what I mean? Uh, for younger people, I remember uh, how many people I've met who spend half their life gaming. Now, I know that you probably don't do that here, but gaming, I mean, they live gaming. Uh, I, know, I know, and that's usually young men, and young ladies are, are always trying to be someone other than who they are. They've found someone they want to look like or act like or be as popular as. And, and, you know, there's so many different things that aren't really sin. I mean, is there anything wrong with holding a, a little device and looking at a screen? No. But it sure, well, unless you're looking at occultic things, bloodshed, or immorality. God says in the Old Testament that he abhors 
gratuitous violence, that's the shedding of blood just for sport. He abhors anything to do with sexual sin and, and lust and all those things. And he hates us being exposed to anything to do with the occult. And what I think is fascinating is, whenever I want to illustrate one of the demons of Revelation, if I type in that demon's name, there is a video game that has an amazing picture of what an artist thinks that demon looks like. And I think, wow, I wonder if any Christians play these games. Because they're looking at what God hates. But when we look at things God hates, that's sin and he forgives us. But that time we spent doing that is good for nothing. It's burned up. And so that's how a lot of people live their lives. So who are we talking about? Well, we're talking about these people, but why does this middle map matter? Well, let me show you something, because in a minute I'm going to describe something. Do you see some of these funny names up there? You know, Thrace, that's over on the, the Greek side. But Bithynia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia. Did you know those names are mentioned in the book of Acts? These are places that the Apostle Paul went, the Apostle Peter went, in fact, First and Second Peter are written to the elect scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's the northern section. In fact, they're kind of clipped off the top of that map. Peter was writing to those people. James was writing to these people. Paul traveled through here three times writing to these people. John spent the end of his life parked in this area. That's why I call it the epicenter. There are more books of the New Testament written to this area than anywhere else. This is the epicenter, not only of Roman culture, but of God's desire to build Christ's church. So, now we're getting to my journal. This is our sixth lesson. Why some believers suffer loss at the Bema seat is what we're going to look at. And we're going to look at Thyatira, and when it comes to Thyatira, and that's, now we have to get to Revelation 2, verse 18. And let me get there with you. Revelation 2, verse 18. It says, and to the angel, the messenger, the pastor, elder, teacher, the church in Thyatira. Thyatira. Boy, that's a strange word, isn't it? We only encounter it here and one other place in the book of Acts. Because if you remember, Lydia, the seller of purple, whose heart the Lord opened in Philippi in Acts 16, was from here. And so, you know, that's about, it's a very limiting thing. But the term, the, the term Thyatira is foreign outside this chapter. To get our bearings, we're going to the geographic area that received the most books of the New Testament. So what did I write? Verse 18. These are what, what you're doing in your little projects. This is what I did. Uh, not this morning. I already had done this one. Um, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And I stopped and I thought about that. And I wrote, the unashamed life. Jesus reminds them he can see into their lives. That's his eyes of fire. Thus, nothing is hidden from him. He judges any sin allowed to stick around in our lives. Remember 1 John 2.28. So I remembered 1 John 2.28. Do you all remember 1 John 2.28? Have you thought about 1 John 2.28? Do you remember it when you read it a while back, whenever you had to read it for whatever class it was for or just in your normal Bible readings? 1 John 2.28 says this, and now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Did you know the people that act like the Thyatirans, that was a church of believers, are going to be ashamed before Christ at his coming. They're going to be ones that, that go, oh, you know, I, I, well, they're not going to be like Jonathan Edwards. Remember with Jonathan Edwards, you know, the famous American Puritan uh, preacher of righteousness and commentator and the president of Princeton and one of the greatest minds in American history. Jonathan Edwards, that one, the sinners in the hands, the angry God one. Do you know what he said? Resolved. He wrote all these resolves in his journal. He was a journaler. Resolved never to be found doing something that I wouldn't want to be doing on the moment Christ returns. He didn't want to be ashamed. That's a limiter. That limited me. When I married my wonderful wife, Bonnie, there was nothing I ever did with any other girl that I ever had 
By the way, I dated 741 different girls before I met Bonnie. I, I dated them, I had their name, the dates I dated them, and I mean, I was a chart person. And I went to a Christian school that had six, 5,000, I don't know how many Christians there, half of them were girls, and I was going to date them all, you know, and I was there a long time. Did you know in none of those 741 young ladies that I spent time alone with did I ever do anything that I would be ashamed before Bonnie or the Lord? Why? Because every day I thought, as I went out with this girl, now if, if I am on any part of this date and the Lord returns, there's nothing I want to be doing that would make me ashamed before Christ who's watching. And I knew that someday I would meet the one person in the whole world I wanted to spend all my time with, and I wouldn't want to be ashamed any time I thought about what I used to do before I met her. He judges any sin that we allowed to stick around in our lives. That's his feet of brass. Secondly, today you're either advancing or retreating. Look at verse 19. This is what Jesus said. Um, whoop, I have to get not 1 John 2, 19. That would have been a shocker for me to read to you. Uh, Revelation 2, 19. I know your works, your love. By the way, this is the only church that he says, commends them for their love. Wow. Of all the seven, Ephesus didn't have their first love, but this church, he says, I know your love. So these were, these were saints. These were people that knew the Lord. I know your service. I know your faith. I know your patience. And as for your works... The last are more than the first. Now look what I wrote. Today you're either advancing or retreating. Jesus knows which way we're headed every day. And he knows whether our works are increasing or decreasing. You see how encouraging these letters are? So God sent more New Testament letters here than anywhere else. Twelve. One of these letters from Revelation, so that's the first book that came to this area. Peter's two epistles. 2 Peter and 1 Peter, so now that's number 2 and 3, were sent directly to this area. Paul's letter to the Galatians, did you see that on the map? Galatia came here. The Ephesians came here. Colossians came here. That's 4, 5, and 6. Plus 1st, 2nd Timothy. Timothy was the pastor of Ephesus, and 1st, 2nd Timothy came to him in this area, and those people heard him saying, I got a letter from God through the Apostle Paul, and they heard it. Plus John's by the way, how many epistles did John write? There we go. So John's three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, came here to these people. And finally, the very first letter that came was the first New Testament epistle. What's that? What was the first New Testament letter written? James. James wrote to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, and the 12 tribes of Israel were scattered all across Asia Minor. For many reasons, they were business people, and through persecution, they were driven out of the Holy Land. And so 12 letters came here. Now, here we go. Look at verse 20, the first part. It says, nevertheless, remember, I showed you all the seven elements. Every letter has, you know, the introduction, the name of Christ, the commendations, and then look at this, nevertheless. I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Boy, was she popular. She came into the church and says, you know what, we've got this new revelation. What God says is, is it okay to live together before you're married? So don't even fret about that. And that's not all. You can live with anybody you want. And you can get involved in the temples of the idol's feasts where the food is cheaper and where there's all this fun. And you can just, look what it says. She came into the church and started teaching, saying, I'm getting a message from God. I'm a prophetess. And she taught and seduced my servants, that's what God calls us, Christians, to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Wow. Revelation 2.20. Jesus knows who's influencing our lives. He knew these people were being influenced by Jezebel. Whether they are challenging us to sanctification. By the way, what does sanctification mean? It's a measure of our usefulness to God. 
You know, a lot of these words are multisyllabic words that we just say, and we don't sometimes try and, and have a meaning for them that, that we can hold on to. Sanctification is how useful I am to God. You know what God says? 1 Thessalonians 5.23, in the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your, this is Paul writing, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of Christ. What Paul said is, God wants to sanctify every part of us. Our mind, our words, our thoughts, our, our feelings, our deeds. What does he want to do with them? A lot of people think sanctification means that, you know, you, you kind of scowl all the time and you say, oh, it's not funny. You know, I'm very serious about the Lord. That is not sanctification. Sanctification is how useful you are to God. I mean, uh, Bonnie and I one time, well, I'll tell you that in a few days. We were, we were eating breakfast somewhere and we were newlyweds and just started at Grace Community Church and we were newlyweds. And as newlyweds, I couldn't have enough time with her. And so every morning at breakfast downtown Los Angeles, I'd read the Bible with her and we'd sit there over breakfast, reading back and forth in the Bible between chews. And, you know, and when I could, I'd slip my hand across the table and hold her hand if I wasn't holding the fork. And, I mean, our waiter would look at us. And he, every morning, because we ate there every day, it was 99 cents. It's fun to be old because you can remember when everything was a deal. And it was 99 cents. And did you know that waiter ended up asking us about the Lord? You see, it is, it is good. It is good to reflect Christ, and people see it, and we're useful to God. Or are they feeding our flesh? Notice the words in this verse, seduce, commit, eat, things which grieve and quench. By the way, what happens when a born-again Christian who has become the very temple of God thinks or does sinful things? What does it do to the person that lives inside the temple? Two things, grieves and quenches. All of you have been grieved. I I assume all of you have been quenched. Quenched means to throw water on a flame and go, you know, campfire, throw the bucket of water on it, goes, you know, it makes a mess, like mud. That's what sin does inside of us to the Spirit of God, quenches him. Let's talk about this city, by the way. Uh, William Ramsey, the famed 19th century archaeologist, wrote this. He excavated the city. He said, revelry, license, intoxication marked the pagan religious societies, the trade guilds, where the inhabitants of Thyatira dined on couches surrounded by troops of unclothed dancing and singing slaves. Uh, I told you on the first lesson, I think, about there are eight types of slaves in the Roman Empire. Well, there was a type that were the dancing, singing, undressed, uh, I don't know what in our culture they would be called, prostitutes, pole dancers, I don't know what. But they were slaves that were hired to come through men reclining on couches, eating meals, and they would pour more alcohol into their cups, and they would dance around with no clothes on. That's what the archaeologists found characterized the business gatherings of Thyatira. Sin, look what I wrote. Sin was everywhere present and powerfully alluring. And what one ancient non-Christian Herodotus, the father of history. Do you know what he said these cultures of of this part of the world were like? He said they were like living in a cesspool. Do you know what a cesspool is? A septic tank? How about a sewer system? How about, you know, where everything goes that you flush from the toilet? That's, it would be like living with the pipe dumping out on you. It's very hard to not get it on you and in you. And that's how they lived. So what were they supposed to do? Well, let's read. Uh, Let's read one thing these people already knew before Jesus wrote to them. It's in 1 Peter 2. Okay? So turn back to 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to read 1 through 3 and 9 through 11. 
Therefore lay aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Peter wrote that to these people living in the flush of the toilet. Okay, he doesn't stop there. Look at down at verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness. You used to like living in the toilet and you don't like it anymore. You've been called out of the darkness into the marvelous light. You were once not a people, but you're now the people of God. You hadn't obtained mercy, verse 10, but now you have obtained mercy. Look at verse 11. Beloved, now this is the Apostle Peter. How would you like to get a letter from Peter? Well, you did. Here it is. But how would you like to back then have gotten one and he was alive? Well, he's still alive, right? (laughs) But he was there. How would you like to get a letter where he says, look at verse 11, I beg you. Peter said, hey, I've been through this myself. I've been tempted. I've been around evil. I've walked through wickedness. I beg you. As sojourners, remember, this world is not my home. I'm on my way somewhere else. As pilgrims, as as people that are headed somewhere else, but temporarily they're walking through this area. That's what we are. Abstain, verse 11, from fleshly lusts. Why? Well, the next Greek word, look it up in your logos. It's a great word, stratuantai, which war. You know what that word is? It's carry on a campaign like terrorists or like guerrilla warfare, like we're watching in the Ukraine. I mean, yesterday, I don't know how much you guys, if you're studying, you probably don't have time to watch all this, but a Ukrainian tank got in the city that was being attacked by the Russians, and it it drove until its turret could point that way and shoot between all the buildings, and between the buildings, they had a straight shot there, and between the buildings. And so this tank was totally hidden to the Russian forces as they were coming through town, but the, the convoy would come through and it would be visible briefly between those buildings, those buildings, those buildings, and those buildings. And that one tank took out the convoy because as soon as they all got between the buildings, it went and hit the first one, which stopped the convoy. Then the next one was between the building, it got that one. And there's a drone video of one tank stopping a whole convoy. You know what that's called? guerrilla warfare, where they don't see where you are. You're not fighting them on the open field. You're hiding. Look at what it says in verse 15. Fleshly lusts are stratuantying against your soul. Satan knows what he can do to deflate your spiritual life, to make you or me grieve the Holy Spirit so much that he becomes sabetomai, quenched. The water thrown on him. Wow. So they had to choose whether to serve Christ every day. And Christ's call to holiness has never changed. In fact, we live in the present based on the past. Let's read what else they knew, okay? You know what's so much fun? The more you study the Bible. When I read Galatians 2.20, I don't just think of a white page with black type on it. I think of people living in this town with the troops of dancing girls giving them alcohol and being tempted every day, getting this verse. This, do you all know Galatians 2.20? How many of you have it memorized? You learned it in school or Sunday school? I'm crucified with Christ. You, none of, there's no one in this whole room that has Galatians 2.20 memorized? Let's try again. How many of you know Galatians 2.20? There we go. That is one of the most important verses in the New Testament. In fact, you should be listening to the professors, if for nothing else, to find out some of the most important verses in the Bible. Because you know what the really important ones are? They know them by heart. Because they need them so much. This verse says that we live in the present based on the past. I'm not living in the present wondering if this is going to work. I already know that it's a past event that's once and for all settled and it works, okay? And look what these people knew. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. By the way, that's Paul's testimony. 
Paul, Paul said, you know what? The way I know I'm saved, he loved me and he gave himself for me. That's the whole idea of redemption, of a substitute, of the redeemer. And Paul says, that's my testimony. The one who loved me and gave himself for me. But he says, the way I live my life with all the, the, the wickedness, the cesspool. Paul, Paul was doing missionary journeys. I mean, every time Paul walked through town, he walked through the gymnasium area where everybody was exercising with no clothes on. He walked through the bathhouse area where everybody was, was taking baths with no clothes on with, with more of these slaves, you know, ladies in there. I mean, you talk about the wickedness that was pervasive. They, they didn't even think it was wickedness, it was normal. It was kind of like they lived in an unclothed culture. How do you live in an unclothed culture? I have been crucified with Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he died in my place. And he has disarmed the power that Satan used to have over me through those sins. As long as the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. So guess what? Either you're floating along with the world or you're resisting it. With Jesus, there's no middle ground. You can't coast. Remember, we already covered that with the Ephesians. You can't tread water. Either you float along or you resist. Now, real quickly, let's see. It's 841, slide 11. I'll blame it on the quiz. When I was little, we used to have canoe trips in our church. You know what a canoe trip was? Uh, they would take the whole youth group, and we'd all be excited. We'd get on a school bus. Behind the school bus was a trailer with a bunch of canoes on it and all the gear. They would drive upstream of this river that was, you know, kind of meandering down. They'd put us all in, our canoes in. Everyone had a life jacket. Everyone had a paddle. No one stayed in the canoe. Everybody was splashing everybody with the paddles. But you know what curiously happened? No matter what we were doing, the canoes kept moving. It was the current of the river. See, they put you upstream. So all things flow downstream. And so we would be splashing and jumping in and out of the canoes and ducking each other, but we'd keep moving down the river because the canoes were traveling with the current. When you and I were born, we were born on a canoe trip, and we came into this world in our little canoe, and in and out of it, and we're having fun and splashing, and all of a sudden, our canoe bumped into someone. And he's standing here, and he's saying, hey, you keep going that way. It's the way of destruction. It's the wide way. The whole current of the world is going that way. But I want you to go that way. And if you are going to be my follower, you're going that way toward the narrow gate, the straight way, the way of Christ. And Jesus, when we get saved, turns our canoe around and hands us the paddle. It says you're not floating anymore. You're resisting the world. You're resisting the philosophies. You're resisting the errors. You're resisting the iniquities of this world. Did you know you never know the strength of the current till you put the paddle in? It's hard to resist the world. So you know what? With Jesus, there's no middle ground. He says you aren't going to coast. You're not going to tread water. You're not going to float along. The world is a powerful river. Its current is always flowing away from God. That's what Matthew 7 says. And they're all going toward destruction, and you've got to go that way. And you know what happens when we go that way? People try and turn our canoe around. They go, we're bumping into everybody. Everybody's going to the party. We're not. We're going this way. They go, what's wrong with you? And they try and help us get reoriented to go where they're going. That's what First Peter's about. By the way, the Bible says there are only healthy Christians and sick Christians. And the question is, which are we? If it wasn't 843, I would take you to Isaiah. There are three verses that you really ought to have memorized and really ought to have marked. The first one is, Isaiah 32, 17, is the work of righteousness is peace, and the effects of righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. Wow. That means if you live the life of Christ, you are peaceful, assured, confident, and people feel that. They see that. You know what Isaiah 48, 18 says? Oh, that you had hearkened unto me. Then should your peace have been as the river. You know what a river is? It's constantly flowing. You would have constant flowing peace. And your righteousness like the waves of the sea. What's that? Constantly renewed. Versus Isaiah 57, 20. You know what that says? The wicked are like the restless sea, 
constantly troubled and foaming up all their shame. That's how we were born, Isaiah 57, 20. When we meet Christ, if we're healthy, we're Isaiah 32, 18. Righteousness and peace. Well, the next observation I made, and I wrote down in my journal, beware of sinning against your own body. It says in 2.20, she, she asked you, this Jezebel, to commit sexual immorality. Sexual things are always tied to us on the inside of our body. It's called our temple. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 6.18. I love this verse. Flee sexual immorality, Paul said. By the way, the leather workers, Bonnie and I were just there. Bonnie and I taught uh, in Greece for, in October, I think, for four weeks. And we, our class we were teaching, we'd take field trips. We took a field trip two days to Corinth. And I showed them the leather workers' quarter, and you can see right from the leather workers' quarter where Paul worked, you can see the gymnasium. So Paul was around sexual immorality all the time in Corinth. And look what he writes in verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So... Why, what's that matter? Look at the next verse. Oh, do you not know? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We're supposed to renew the challenge of 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 to consecration. What's consecration? Asking God to control, lead, protect, and cleanse me. Because I don't belong to myself. And someday I'm going to stand in front of him and explain what I did with my body. And why this is so important is Peter, in his second epistle, second, that these people got, talks about Lot. Do you remember Lot? Lot, the nephew of Abraham, made a choice. He could either go with Abraham or he could go anywhere he wanted. And it says he moved his tent and it actually says he pitched his tent with the door of it towards Sodom the worst city on earth of his day. And he didn't pitch his tent so he was looking toward Uncle Abraham's tent. He pitched his tent to look toward the worst place on earth. So you all know that. And he lost everything. He's an example of being saved by fire. We will give an account for what we do in this body, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, and that determines everything forever. So what happens with someone that keeps sinning? Have you ever thought about that? Do you know people? They're secretly in sin, and, but yet they're still in the church. You know, they sing in the choir, but they're still, you know, messing around with their boyfriend or girlfriend. They, they secretly are in all kinds of stuff, you know. When I went to one of the most conservative Christian universities in the world, it was called Bob Jones University, when I went there, we had one of the most well-loved students, and he was always drinking water. He actually had a one-gallon milk jug, and he was kind of known as a health nut, and he was always drinking water. He would refill that thing constantly. He was always drinking it. And what we found out was he was also drinking something else, alcohol. And he was constantly flushing it through his system. But he was almost an, almost an alcoholic at the world's largest, at that time, Christian university. But he was known as a health nut because he masked it so well because he was constantly drinking water. In other words, he was fake. It's amazing. What happens when people persist in unrepentant sin? I'll read you. 1 John 5.16 says, There is a sin that leads to death. Wait a minute. What kind of death? A Christian who persists in sin? That's not spiritual death. Correct. It's not going to hell. It's a different kind of death. Real quickly, let's see. We have a minute and a half. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, because I think many people have not thought about what happens after the Lord's Supper? Remember the Lord's Supper verses? Uh, Paul said, uh, For I deliver unto you first of all that which I also receive, how that Christ said in the night in which he was doing the supper, he said, This is my body. You know, everyone intones that. You've heard your pastor say, 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord's Supper part. But look at verse 27. Therefore, of 1 Corinthians 11, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. A Christian guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever drinks, verse 29, in an unworthy manner, 
eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30. For this reason, many are weak and sick and many sleep. He wasn't talking about this class. Many sleep. (laughs) He was talking about believers who persisted in unrepentant sin and were chastened by the Lord and became weak and sick and died. 